Good evening. My name is Johanna Koljonen and you are watching Crosstalks, a collaboration between two of Sweden's leading universities, Stockholm University and KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. We are airing live and at the end of this program, in roughly 37 minutes, do take advantage of the unique opportunity to ask questions directly of our participating experts. You can do so by simply calling us on Skype, where our name is Crosstalks TV. And as always, you can also discuss today's topics on Twitter, where we call ourselves at Crosstalks TV and our hashtag is Crosstalks. Working as a researcher can take you far in every sense of the word. Perhaps you'll go on expeditions measuring greenhouse gases in the Arctic Ocean, investigate language patterns among voodoo communities in Brazil, or build broadband infrastructure in remote places on continents far from your home. Today we'll discuss the challenges and the unique perspectives that come with taking your academic field into the field. Joining us today in the studio are Urian Gustafsson, professor at the Department of Applied Environmental Science and the Bullin Center for Climate Research at Stockholm University, also recently inducted into the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Laura Alvarez Lopez, associate professor in Portuguese at Stockholm University, and Bjorn Persson, professor emeritus at the School of Information and Communication Technology at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Please give them a warm round of applause. Örjan Gustafsson, you're just back from a three-month-long Swiras expedition to the Arctic, a joint effort between <coughs> Swedish and Russian, Rus Russian researchers on an icebreaker, no less. What was your group's main focus on this trip, and uh, what did you find? Well, this Swiras C3 stands for the Swedish-Russian-US Arctic Ocean investigation of uh, couplings between the climate, uh, the cryosphere, and uh, the carbon cycle. And uh, one of the main focuses for us was to, to look at how uh, processes in the natural system could be triggered that would uh, uh, thaw out very old permafrost and that frozen methane would collapse and both of those could lead to, to uh, extra greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide and methane being released from these systems that would add to the greenhouse gases that we are releasing uh, by, uh, by human actions. That was the main focus. And, uh, and methane and additional carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere would be very bad news, essentially. That would not be good news, absolutely. That would be uh, quite uh, uh, unfortunate. Uh, so, but the, the question here, or our challenge, was to, uh, to after years of preparation, uh, use the, uh, the icebreaker ODA, probably the most uh, uh, capable research icebreaker in the world, to go to the furthest way area of the Arctic Ocean, the Siberian Arctic Ocean. The reason is that that area holds uh, uh, most of the, the subsea uh, permafrost, frozen sea bottom, and also frozen methane that if thawed out, there's so much carbon there that that could lead to massive releases of these greenhouse gases. We don't see that now. We do see that there are releases, which is more than what we thought four or five years ago. But so we want to understand this system better so that we can uh, uh, have a chance of predicting what the future releases are going to be. At the risk of, of sounding like a complete fool, do you already know what you found out or do you have to analyze results for months and years before you know? Both. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, w certainly we, we did find that uh, uh, the permafrost uh, along the coastline here in these very desolate areas and also in the ocean bottom is thawing. Uh, making the organic matter available to bacteria to break down mm -hmm. to these greenhouse gases. And we saw that methane was oozing out from several of these places. Uh, but uh, it we, will have, uh, we have now a gold mine observations and samples that will keep us busy for, uh, for many years to come. To, to really increase the understanding of this system. I think a gold mine of observations is, is something that we're going to return to with, with everything we talk about on this hour. Laura Alvarez Lopez, you are a language researcher. You worked in the field a lot. Uh, for example, you did your doctoral thesis stu studying the languages of voodoo groups in Brazil. Could you tell us a little bit about your work and what sort of challenges you face in a project like that? Well, um, lots of challenges, I, I think, when you go out to the field and you work with people, you depend on other people, you, you take their time. Also, we do recordings or uh, 
questionnaires about language use, uh, recordings with people that we have to, to transcribe later and analyze, or I was also participating and um, observing, observing different linguistic practices in order to um, study the relationship uh, between language and identity, but also um, studying the African heritage in Brazil, mm. because identity is many times expressed through the use of, of um, African words and expressions. And uh, of course, uh, I, I think maybe the, the biggest challenge for me was to get into this groups, uh, Brazilian Voodoo is called Candomblé, and these groups, they're not closed, they're open and they welcome anybody that wants to get into religion, but I wasn't there uh, to be a member of the religious group, I, I was there as a researcher. And it was very, it took me two or three months to get to a place and record something and I, I was very uh, it, it was a challenge because if I didn't get my data I couldn't write my thesis <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and you had a li limited period of time to to write a PhD thesis so so the main ch challenge was to get into a group and and get the possibility to record and build a kind of trust as well, I imagine. So, but yes. but you wouldn't be. I don't. Did you feel like a member of the group in the end? Did you become part of the community in some sense, or, or do you have to stay a step outside to be able to, to work? Yes. Uh, if you are if you're a researcher, you are an outsider because you're not not there because of religion. You're mm -hmm. there because of your research questions or your interest, curiosity. And uh, I'm not a part of the group, but I go to Brazil today and I meet people that participated in my studies and they're my friends and, and we go and drink coffee or beer and, and have fun together. So um, I'm a friend of the groups where I work. I think uh, I, I used to call myself there. I, I'm not religious, but I sympathize with these religious groups. And, and they uh, adopted me as a sympathizer. <laughs> That's really nice. Uh, so Orion works with the natural world uh, and going into difficult, uh, uh, difficult environments. You go into social, envi social environments, and yes. you're, I think you're somewhere in between. So you have a long career beyond person of working in the field. Among many other things, you've been involved in several projects for building IT infrastructure uh, in places in Asia and Africa where that hasn't uh, been previously av available. Could you tell us a little bit about your work and what problems you're trying to solve? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, first, uh, I should say that I was brought there. Uh, all the places I've gone, I was brought by my students. <laughs> Uh, so they, uh, they asked me to get involved in, in problem solving of different sorts. And I remember when first coming to Africa, I think this was 2001, uh, it was in Mozambique. Uh, there was, um, I'm in, uh, in, in, in the internet uh, area, so uh, total uh, um, bandwidth out of uh, Mozambique, in and out of Mozambique was one megabit and uh, the university used half of it. And they paid $15,000 per month, per month, for uh, per megabit. Uh, so uh, obviously they, uh, they had a, a challenge uh, uh, doing this. So uh, uh, together with my PhD student there, uh, we looked around uh, what uh, could be the solutions, and uh, we found a fiber, optical fiber, uh, deployed in a... Uh, high power uh, network. It was not uh, used for, for uh, public telecommunications. It was used for uh, controlling the transformers of the power line. Mm -hmm. And they used uh, a, a tiny little portion of all the uh, 24 or 48 fiber pairs they had access to. So there was a lot of capacity from uh, Maputo, the uh, capital of Mozambique, to Johannesburg. So we asked uh, the company, could we use a few for uh, uh, the university? And they said, yes, if, uh, if it's allowed, uh, if the policy allows it. And uh, 
and if we can agree on the uh, cost for it. Uh, and we failed utterly on both these uh, areas. Uh, it was uh, perfectly okay to use it on the Mozambican side, but uh, uh, South Africa was at the time one of the policy-wise most closed countries. So uh, we couldn't do it without involving their monopoly uh, operator. And they, of course, said that since fiber is better than satellite, it has to be more expensive. So uh, it was just uh, didn't work out. So we got some funding to uh, look around for fiber elsewhere, not uh, uh, to South Africa, and we found a lot of fiber. And actually that led to, to involving more students, and we got some funding from the European Union to look for fiber everywhere. So I've been essentially looking into all the 53 at the time countries of Africa. It's now 54, but uh, this was before South, uh, South Sudan. Uh, uh, came into existence. So um, I know a lot about uh, the fiber infrastructure at least a few years ago uh, when I did this study. And uh, there is a lot of students that are now involved in building the, especially the, uh, the uh, academic infrastructure like uh, uh, we have in Europe, the Swedish University Network in Sweden and so on. Uh, so there are similar uh, activities there. So a short-term goal is to, or a goal on the way is, is to, to build a good internet infrastructure between universities uh, in, on the African continent. But the, the long-term goal, obviously, is to, is to build a more solid connection with the rest of the internet. Uh, right, uh, yes. Uh, but yes. Uh, perhaps more interesting is the fact that I, uh, another um, PhD student in Tanzania, uh, got the assignment by, uh, it was SIDA uh, fi funding this, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency uh, to uh, uh, formulate, find a scalable model for getting uh, uh, broadband, establishing broad, uh, sustainable broadband uh, markets in areas where there is demand but no supply because no commercial actor wants to go there because there is no infrastructure and uh, it's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, what you meet is mostly lions and giraffes and things like that. So uh, he has had a project uh, uh, building a network in Ser through Serengeti, not the park but outside the park uh, on the border between Tanzania and Kenya. I think many, uh, I mean, many people look at, think of research as an incredibly desk-bound job. When you guys started out, did you imagine, did you always know that you would also be in the field? No? Yes? It was uh, certainly one of the uh, attractions, I think, to, I started studying chemistry. Mm. And then uh, I realized pretty early that uh, chemistry is a key tool and, and key, key science for understanding uh, nature. But uh, my, my intention was to apply the, the, the chemistry and physics and so on to, to understand how the, how the natural world functioned and uh, the interactions between what we do as a society and the, and the natural world. Lara? Um, yes, I think so, because I have done field work also on my degree projects and master mm -hmm. projects. So I, I think as a social linguist, it's uh, a normal uh, method to to get your data. Yeah. But in, in internet uh, studies, certainly, f you can totally do field work without leaving your office. You say you were dragged out into the field by your students. Mm -hmm. uh, were students with backgrounds in these areas uh, or...? or Yes, my area is telecommunication systems, and they were uh, PhD and some master students in, in, uh, in that area. So, um, uh, of course, uh, well, uh, I mean, it's also a matter of personality. Uh, uh, as a researcher, I, uh, I get stimulated by practical problems, uh, and even my more theoretical results stem from such uh, uh, observations of problems. Uh, and, of course, I also feel uh, it's nicer. I did more theoretical study when I was younger, but uh, I found it nicer to be useful. Do you uh, consider yourself adventurers or explorers or something like that? <laughs> it's okay to say. A little bit? To what degree? Björn? Well, uh, of course, uh, uh, there has been some adventurous parts of this, but uh, I wouldn't say, uh, well, perhaps, yes. A little <laughs> it's nice, Laura. Yes, I, maybe sometimes, not 
it depends on what kind of field work you do and, and where you do it. I, I, I think some, uh, when I, I, I went with two colleagues to Angola in June, and I think that was kind of an adventure because um, uh, one of us had been in Angola before, but not the other two, and, and we were going to Cabinda, that is in enclave in the Congos, and it felt very exotic for me that uh, I'm more used to going to Brazil or uh, South America, so it's a new field. And, and also, I think, as explorer there, because a lot of things are going on in Angola that we wanted to observe. You didn't choose Angola, uh, because it was Angola and, and people speak Portuguese there also. Uh, they also speak African languages, but we chose this field because um, we thought it was a good pl place to get, get data in order to explain um, a lot of things about ongoing language change. When What happens when a big group of people changes uh, language from speaking yeah. different African languages uh, to speak a European language. And, and this is happening now in Angola, and, and it's happening very fast. So we wanted to go there just to, to see this, and, and this was very exciting for us. <laughs> so it's a gold mine of data. Again, you have to go, you have to, go to where the things are happening yes. to, to find to find the, the uh, excitement, I guess intellectual excitement, as well as possibly danger. But I realize you're not going for the danger because that would be <laughs> silly. Oh, yeah. It's not, the, I, yeah, your <laughs> question there. I mean, the driving force is not the adventure or the, the explorations, but of course there are some of those elements that are strong. I mean, we go out on, on smaller Russian vessels in the, uh, in the north of, of Siberia, or we go to very small islands in the Maldives where we have climate observatories, or in countryside in Bangladesh and all that. And, you know, the science is a driving force, but actually wh when we look back at what, what we've done, what we remember is n oftentimes the, um, the, uh, the adventures or exploration, personal experiences that you have. And that's what is really enriching, the human meetings in the countryside there and how we solved when this incident broke down and so on. So it is the adventure part of it that sort of uh, remains for the dinner conversations afterwards. I guess a lot of people who are working in laboratories have a lot of, you know, I, I think anytime you work with equipment and science, the equipment will break down, and everybody who works in laboratories has a lot of uh, emotions and feelings about this. It's a little bit more dramatic, certainly, if it happens in another type of environment. You don't have to go back to a cubicle to, to solve it. Uh, joining us now on Skype from New York is photojournalist Ed Cashy, who is certainly no stranger to working in the field. You've documented life in every corner of the world. Welcome to Crosstalks, Ed. Huh? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. So I had muted myself to save you from my sounds. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, Ed. Uh, short introduction. Ed has won numerous awards from his work from World Press Photo, Pictures of the Year International, as well as UNICEF's Picture uh, Photo of the Year, among many others. Also published several books, produced 17 feature stories for National Geographic magazine. Ed, what do you think drives you uh, to seek the people and places that you document? Uh, is it the adventure or is it, is it the the data, so to speak, the art in this context. Yeah, well, you know, I think I'm driven by the issues and I'm driven by the stories. Sorry about the call, <laughs> right. uh, uh, but I won't pick it up. Uh, and, um, you know, that's really what drives me. And, and so quite often, as opposed to being a writer, and but very similar, similarly to being an academic or a researcher, is we have to get out in the field. We have to see these places. We have to smell and feel and, and understand them because... <clears throat> One thing I've found through the years is that regardless of how much research I do or how brilliant uh, the writers I work with or the editors I work with are, it, it's always different once you're in the field, you know, and that's where you, tr that's where you get the, the, the reality, if you like, or, or at least some version of the truth. So, and then on a personal level, it's uh, uh, certainly more fulfilling, you know, you, you get to, to, you get this intimate firsthand experience. I wonder what kinds of, of sacrifices does it involve to go away? Y y I mean, to, to go on these trips, it sounds very exciting, but is, are there any downsides? Do you go for long times? Ed, what about you? Do, are your journeys long? Yeah, well, they're not as long now as they were years ago. Uh, part of that is, is budget, <laughs> the way the, uh, the media has changed. 
But um, yeah, no, that is one of the toughest things. Uh, actually, I'm leaving tomorrow for South Sudan for three and a half weeks uh, to work on a, a project about uh, the famine for UNICEF. And um, just this morning, my 16-year-old daughter, getting ready for school, said to me, where are you going? How long are you going for? Mm -hmm. And she goes, boy, that's going to be really heavy. And it reinforced my, I tried not to cry. I waited until she got <laughs> left. But, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it takes a huge toll. And when I used to go away for two months, three months at a time, uh, before I had, I had children, it was, it was different. I was much younger and, and the, the adventure and excitement uh, uh, are what prevailed, if you like. Whereas now, knowing what I know and experiencing what I've experienced, similar to your other guests here, you know, that uh, there's more of a heaviness for me. Mm -hmm. So there's this excitement about, you know, what will I see? What will I encounter? What will I learn? Um, but then there's also this sort of uh, uh, anxiety, if you like, about being away from home for a long time, in, in some places taking personal risks, security risks. Mm -hmm. And um, those things weigh very, very heavily, very heavily. What about you, Arjen? You went away for three months uh, into the Arctic. It, it, it feels, it sounds like a very long time. Is it a very long time when you're there? Three months sounds terrible. I'm very glad I only went for a month and a half. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but it was long enough, actually. <laughs> so se seven weeks in the end. And uh, I, I really second Ed uh, on, on the, the feelings around that. I mean, yeah, uh, we have three younger kids between five and, uh, and ten. And uh, that's the heaviest toll, for mm -hmm. sure, to be away from them. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I get home and uh, time has passed quickly and uh, they're telling me that they had a great summer. Yeah. I don't know how to interpret that exactly. No, actually, that's, that's one of the hardest things is coming home and then they're in their lives. Nothing has changed for them per se. And you are full of all these stories and they don't want to hear any of them. <laughs> I think, it's, I've yeah. some, I think I've had some very rough like yeah. reintroduction dinners with my family. <laughs> it's a, it's a key it's a key key thing actually when coming home from these trips to to ask how have they been? Yeah. And not talk about your own trip. What about you guys? What about you Bjorn? What are what is the cost? What is the price? Is there a sacrifice? Uh, well, yeah, I, I guess uh, during a 10 year period I've been away for if you add all the weeks. Uh, I seldom travel more than a week or two. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you add them up, it becomes two years out of ten. So uh, uh, that, yeah. of course, is, uh, uh, has its price. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I try as much as possible to send off the students instead of myself. Uh, and um, uh, I, uh, I think, really think it's too hot in Africa. Uh, <laughs> so I, I rather stay home. Uh, a, a typical Swede uh, enjoys uh, snow and ice rather than, than <laughs> heat. Uh, I haven't, uh, I've very seldom come into situations like Ed described, although I often get in touch, uh, sort of, not personally, but via uh, the people I meet, uh, especially in Somalia, where there uh, has, uh, uh, during the period uh, where there, it was really tough there. Uh, we have been working a lot with Somalia, but not in Somalia. Yeah. What about you, Laura? What do you think is, is the cost? Is there a price? No, I haven't. When I have been for a longer time, I had my family with me, so that mm. wasn't a problem. And, and then I have been away for like three weeks or a shorter periods of field work. So, uh, no, I think when you say sacrifice, I, I think about food and, and I'm a vegetarian, <laughs> so it's not always uh, easy to get vegetarian food. Uh, in a religious temple in Brazil or mm -hmm. somewhere in Angola. Yeah. So that has been a price, <laughs> but it's, yeah. I mean, I managed. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, are there any examples that you have of something you've learned in the field that you couldn't have learned in any other place? Oh yeah, absolutely. Orion. Oh. Hmm? Orion first. Yeah, I mean, sci scientifically, I mean, it's, uh, it's for us who are uh, environmental and climate scientists, it's absolutely crucial to get out and do uh, real-world observations. There are many things we could not have learned without going out there. I mean, it's, it would be impossible to sit uh, in the office at uh, Stockholm University and learn about the, the composition and the potential of, uh, of uh, Arctic Ocean sea bottom to release methane or 
to learn about how, what the brown clouds that oozes out from India and China, air pollution, what is the composition of this brown cloud without going there and actually sampling it and bringing mm -hmm. home samples for analysis. So we certainly learn, have to go out in the field to, uh, to learn how the natural system works. Ed? Well, I, yeah, I'd like to actually pick up on that point because even though uh, not much of my work is climate-focused, um, uh, um, by the way, you know, there's a huge climate march Saturday in New York City. I don't know if you guys know that. So hopefully many, many people will show up. But, um, you know, but I, by, by, by being to so many of the places I've been to, it has, it has in, in graphic terms, shown how much humans are messing up the earth. The, the, the climate and whether you believe in climate change or not is irrelevant. I'm talking about pollution, pollution of our waters, pollution of our, of our, of our air, um, you know, that these are things you can read about, but if, it, it, but if you see them and if you smell them and feel them, you know, it, uh, it's really dramatic and it's, and it's alarming. Um, but the other thing is that quite often when I've gone to places where there's maybe conflict or, or, or danger, uh, so often once you get there, I'll, I'll, I'll say, it's not as dangerous as I thought. You know, I'm all nervous and scared. And then you get there and you realize, you know, everybody's not killing each other. It's daily life is carrying on. And, and um, you know, and it's not as dangerous as it seems. I will say, though, that in Iraq and in Afghanistan, it is more dangerous, actually. <laughs> but everywhere else in the world, you get there and you're going, you know, the, there's so many wonderful people. There's daily life going on. And so, again, there's nothing that replaces uh, first-hand experience. I guess some of the question, you, you were talking about before also about, about the importance of, of uh, trying to solve real-world problems. There's something about, about science uh, where you maybe are not asking the right questions unless you put yourself in the environment. You go there to, to answer some questions. Maybe when you get out into the field, you realize you weren't, exact, you weren't exact, ask, asking the exact right question. There was something else uh, happening as well. I, I wonder, though, uh, historically speaking, when we talk about, about scientific expeditions, what we think about this sort of 19th century uh, science, science and, and certainly the, the, also the roots of National Geographic, for instance, is these exploration societies that, that have, have a very strong uh, co connection to colonial history. I think probably this is different uh, now. And certainly, I know, Laura, that you went back to the people that you researched and, and, in, and shared uh, perhaps some of your results uh, with them. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, once when I was trying to get places to, r to, to do my recordings, I talked to this woman. She was a priestess and she said, no, I don't want you to record here because you're going to go to the other side of the world. You'll write something about my religion in a language that I don't understand and I won't ever have access to that. And that was the first time I said, no, I'm, I'm doing a PhD in Portuguese. I will write my thesis in Portuguese. And, and if you help me, I'll come back and I can give you my thesis and you're welcome to read it. So um, after several years when I was finished and, and I went, next time I went back to Brazil, I brought my thesis. I don't know if people are so interested in, in my analysis of communication there because there are there because of religion and not research. But um, one of the priests that um, I, I knew very well, he said he had read it and it was very boring and repetitive. <laughs> 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 but it means something uh, that to say that, that this, the narrative of, of going out and taking knowledge and bringing it back has changed. Uh, certainly, I think this is a great example uh, of that. Ed. Yeah, oh, I, ha I have to interject on this point because, especially um, as a as a as a photojournalist, you know, or being in the media, and maybe the, uh, your other guests will will corroborate this. Um, the internet has erased this conceit that we can go, that I can go to South Sudan and make these pictures and try to tell these stories, and that they will never see it. So now I have to be more responsible. I have to be more aware of the fact that, that those folks will see my work. And actually, this is a great thing that's happened because it, there was a conceit in the media, certainly. I don't know about academia, where you could go to these places 
and they never have to see what we did. And so there's this sort of level of um, a lack of um, accountability, if you like, or responsibility on our part. Mm -hmm. And so I, I welcome this change. Uh, but the other thing, you know, uh, I want to relate to the previous question. It makes me think about how I see myself as a best in certain ways. And I don't mean to overstate that. But that when I'm in other cultures and other countries, I'm, I'm critically aware that, that as an American, first of all, given the terrible reputation of America right now, I need to behave in a certain way. I need to present myself in a certain way. I need to explain what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, so that I can make people accept me or I will hopefully they will accept me and they can relax, trust me. Um, yeah. I think this is really important no matter what you do. And I think for your other guests, you spend large amounts of time. And I would guess probably forge deeper relationships than I generally do with the, our subjects. It's even more critical. That, you know, we all behave in this, uh, the opposite of a neo-colonial manner. Yeah. Frankly. Yeah. Uh, Örjan, you're nodding uh, at, uh, at forming bonds yeah, and responsibilities. Yeah, I can, I can definitely yeah. pick up on, on that. And there is certainly an aspect of that in, uh, in science, uh, whether we collaborate with Russian scientists in the Arctic or with uh, Bangladeshi or Indian scientists in, uh, in South Asia. It is uh, crucial uh, to, to be very uh, careful uh, and thoughtful when selecting local colleagues there. Uh, so you have a uh, mutually beneficial scientific collaboration. And that is actually uh, something uh, really valuable scientifically for them, mm -hmm. as well as for, for us, so that we, we both benefit from this collaboration and that way will be long term. The alternative is to just find any local group and you know, pay them a little bit to, to arrange the logistics and all these type of things. But that's, that would be, to me, scientific colonialism. Yes, exactly. The and history uh, is yeah, you would have gotten yeah. a fixer. Now you find a local university and, and create exactly. true collaboration. But that doesn't yeah. really work very well. And it certainly <laughs> doesn't work for the long term. So, I mean, so so fixer, it's yeah. very, very important to, uh, to, uh, to build on long term uh, uh, collaboration with local research groups and make sure that, uh, that everyone uh, benefits. But if, you, but if you do, I mean, on the other hand, sometime, it sounds like sometimes it could be easier to just get out there, do your experiment, and come home. Uh, it sound, from what I know about academic work, administration and communication and planning and budgeting and all of these things that are not research take up a lot of your time. Certainly, I'm, I'm assuming building, building research networks uh, with partner universities around the globe to be able to do specific things must take an enormous amount of time. Is there space for it? Uh, is there enough space for it? Yeah, the, al the alternative is to be to do uh, run risk of, of failure uh, completely. So I think I mean, of course, I'm, I'm fortunate. I have a permanent position now, so I can take a long term perspective. Mm -hmm. But I think it's necessary in this to take long term perspectives and then uh, one, one would definitely benefit uh, investing some in such relationships. What about you, Bjorn? Because when I mean, you're you're literally changing the societies uh, where you go, and and even though I'm thinking some of the doctoral students uh, maybe from these countries actually that are involving you in these projects, even so, what are, are some of the ethical concerns about about engaging with the local communities there? Well, uh, I don't change the countries; uh, they change themse themselves, and uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, awareness raising workshops and things like that to to uh, to facilitate that to make it possible for them to take their own uh, decisions and uh uh, we have. I have colleagues. That's not my speciality. I mean, uh, I look more into the technical parts of this. But the the big challenge is, uh, well, on the technical side, it's really power rather than ICT. But uh, mm -hmm. but uh, on on the the real challenges are ownership and leadership and uh, and the uh, uh, social process. And uh, we uh, we just uh, look at that. We don't. Uh, we don't. Uh, we have local partners that uh, do that part. I, I just a thought just struck me. So uh, an expedition like yours, uh, Orion, it would you would have scientists from very many different disciplines collaborating about this massive expedition, so you can share resources and so on. 
would it only be natural scientists, scientists or can you bring, can, would, do you ever bring, bring people from the humanities, for instance, along? Are there those kinds of partnerships? Could you bring a sociolinguist yeah, with sure. you? Yeah, sure. Sure. I mean, there are all, uh, it's very uh, uh, cross uh, science kind of work that we do. So uh, uh, there are p local partners in sociology, uh, ethnology, and uh, economics, and uh, even technology, and all sorts, uh, medicine. Uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, building networks means is not really uh, interesting as such. You have to use it for something. So that's one of the first questions. So we need to involve uh, people that uh, can make sure that uh, things are being used. And, and the, the first things you do is to look at healthcare, education, uh, uh, local government, things, uh, things like that, that are really important for the local communities. Mm. I'm uh, curious about the sort of preparations for going on these kinds of journeys. We have this cultural idea now that travel is very easy. You just go online and book a ticket and then you get your passport and a toothbrush and a cred credit card and off you go. I, if, there are still places in the earth, I would imagine, where it isn't that easy to go. Uh, you were smiling, <laughs> Laura. Is it, is it that easy to go to Angola, for instance? Can you just pop off? Uh, no, because you have, uh, when Odin was talking here about local uh, partners, we had to have a local partner and an invitation from an Angolan university to be able to get a visa mm. uh, to go there. So that wasn't that easy. And uh, I don't know, I have planned field works and you have to plan very much if you go for three weeks to Angola to, to make 50 interviews and get hundreds of questionnaires. You have to plan your time and your schedule very well. But when you get to the field, um, the field doesn't adapt to your plans. <laughs> so normally you have to have a plan B and that doesn't work either. So you have to think out new plans uh, every time. And, and that happens to me every time. And, and maybe more when you work with people that, that you have to deal with and wait for and meet in different places and find and so on. And people have jobs, and you can o they can only meet you at a time when they can meet you, yeah. and all of these kinds of things. Or happening. they came 24 hours after they told you they were coming, and yeah. things like that. Are there any? Uh, let's see. Is there any advice that is applicable almost whatever field you're in? When if you if you go somewhere out of your own comfort zone, out into another environment to do work, is there some general advice? Does anybody have anything? Ed. Um. Mm. Off the top of your head. Yeah, no, and before I answer that, I want to say, picking up on, on last comments, was that if I were to write a memoir, it would be titled, You Should Have Been Here Last Week. <laughs> so, it, <laughs> yeah. so and, and then the subtitle would be, Or You Should, have, or you should Come Next Week. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so um, I think for me, the operating, um, the principles that guide me now are to be humble and to be... Um, to try to have an open heart and an open mind as much as is possible. Some days are better than others on that. And um, to listen um, and to not push people around when things aren't going my way. When I was younger and I would get angry with people, I realized now what a fool I was. And that actually, actually it was Nigeria that taught me that la uh, about 10 years ago. I could yell and stomp as much as I wanted because it, they weren't, it wasn't going my way and they would just look at me and I realized that was not going to inspire them to help me anymore. Yeah. And uh, so there's something about releasing to the currents of the place you're in and the, and the, the tempo and the way things work, you know, um, and, and you get more out of that in the end so one instead is, of just being yeah. constantly frustrated. Constantly frustrated. So that's also know. part of your preparation is to f if, if everybody that you talk to who have been to this place say, oh, everything takes forever there, add a week. <coughs> Go for one week longer than you thought you would need. Oh, yeah. And we are these yeah. uh, high-speed, super-efficient creatures mm -hmm. here. And, you know, so I second what Ed was saying here. We need to, you need to have more, more patience and uh, you know, keep a little bit of ice in your stomach and uh, <laughs> uh, be, be creative and, and resourceful because mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know you're out there too. And, you know, there is no hardware store next doors either for, for, our, for our type of science and engineering. So uh, you need to find solutions uh, and um, give it a little bit of extra time relative to what you thought it would take. 
And have someone on your team who knows how to actually build and fix things we could be maybe solid advice if you're in... Bring along in fixers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Bjorn, That's you're right. laughing. Do you, have a, do you have a general advice? Uh, well, uh, I can uh, subscribe to all these, uh, but I could add also that uh, money is often a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to uh, do some research before going uh, places. Uh, uh, your credit card would probably not work. Oh, that, you know, on a very practical <laughs> level, money <laughs> is a problem, yes. Yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I thought you were talking about funding, which is of course oh, always okay. a problem. <laughs> yeah, that's yes. always a problem. <laughs> <laughs> what about Laura? <laughs> no, I think I, I recognize uh, most of uh, this you should uh, come next week. That happened to me in Brazil. I, I I was there for almost a year, but there was no temple that had a gathering for a longer time with many people that gathered there in order to for a group to to be initiated into that religion. So I had to go back to Sweden and then go back there again and spend one month there in order to to finish my field work. So. Yeah. All right, I think it's time for questions from the audience. We've, got, we've covered a huge range of fields, I think, so I th the questions could be about anything at this point, I think, related to field work. It can be big things or it can be little things. Who has something on their mind? What happens here is right now is a very Scandinavian moment <laughs> when, when people are feeling a little shy about asking. I'm sure you have something on your mind. Do you? Anything? Yes. Please step up to the podium. Yeah. You can state your name and maybe your university and ask your question, please. Hello, uh, my name is Naim Michael Hajari and uh, I work here at KTH as a research engineer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm involved with one of the projects with the Engineers Without Borders of Sweden and um, this project is about uh, providing clean water in Cameroon. Um, so I was wondering about um, how um, in, in field, when we get in field, uh, um, if people there are not cooperative, um, how could uh, one sort of motivate them? What are the best ways to motivate local people to cooperate with you? Uh, some general advice would be good. Thank you very much for that question. That's a very, very good question. Uh, of course, it, I, I, I realize it's in some ways situation specific, but in other ways, probably not. Who would mm. like to start? Maybe Laura. How do you start by, by gaining that trust or whatever is required to get people to, to cooperate with your project? Um, well, I, I'm thinking about the latest field work when we went to Angola and I have this very energetic uh, colleague that was going to take care of our contacts. So she, was, um, she made the contacts before we went there. And she had this contact. We, we, we saw somebody had, was working at the university uh, with things that interested us. And she emailed and emailed and emailed and didn't get any answers. Sh so she started to call. And she got a very good uh, contact. And, and he solved most of our problems there. And he was the key to other people. Mm -hmm. He was the contact that took us to the village where we recorded, and he was the contact that new teachers we could contact in order to go to schools and, and uh, distribute the questionnaires. And, and he was the one that found an alternative school when we <laughs> saw that we had to change our planes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think trying to, to get so one or two yeah. contacts before you go there is very, very important. What about you, Bjorn? You said in your projects you would always run into these walls of legislation <laughs> or, or, or <laughs> local governance or these kinds of things. How do you start to approach that? Are there any general rules at all? Well, uh, Cameroon is a bit hard from a, regula <laughs> a regulatory point of view. It's not that open. Uh, most countries that I've been working with mm. are more open. Uh, the um, uh, And it's it's hard to give a uh, general advice, I would say. It's... Uh, it's uh, uh, the, the processes that, that I have learned after a long time uh, can make a lot of trouble for you is uh, sort of uh, corruptive mismanagement uh, of different sorts. So uh, they don't really want any change. Uh, at least those that uh, can decide on changes don't want to change. Uh, 
uh, and then it's little you can do. Uh, so uh, you need to uh, to uh, listen very carefully what they want, so not what you think they want, but what they want, what they actually want, and find the people that that. Uh, uh, that uh, can help you realize that. And not uh, necessarily just what people say they want, but you have to listen with your heart yeah, also. Right. Yeah, right, yes, yes. Exactly. Oh, th that's interesting. You mentioned corruption, and, and uh, I think certainly if you have a background in the Nordic countries, uh, th this is this in these countries you don't have a lot of... Uh, it, I mean, corruption looks different here. I'm, I'm sure it exists everywhere in the world, but, but, but the kind of things where you actually have to pay someone to get something that you're entitled to, these kinds of, of, of transactions are very rare. Uh, I, am, I would assume that there are many places in the world where you just have to adjust to the local norms, even when, when you find them morally doubtful, or? Well, we can't do that. As no. an as a academic, as yeah. a part of representatives of these organizations? Exactly. You you, you're not allowed? No. Yeah. So that what do you do? What do you, what have, do, you have, do if you have, can't? You have to find other ways. Okay, then Orian, how do you find other ways? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you can certainly not, you know, you cannot bribe, you know, with, with Swedish taxpayers' money. So you have to find other ways, you know, to, uh, to, to motivate and, you know, or to solve the problem. Uh, what about you, Ed? Are you allowed to pay bribes with your employer's money? Um, no, and, and and beyond beyond that, because you know I've done a lot of work, self financed work as well mm. as um, it's just morally and ethically incorrect way for for journalism to work. I'm so I happy you all say this. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've been. I mean, you know, there are times where where um, you know I might be in a situation where let's say I don't know, I'm just off the top of my head. I might be working on something about. Uh, uh, homelessness, and I might bring someone food, or uh, mm. uh, you know, something like that. But I never give money. Um, um, what what has been difficult? There have been some co couple of countries, and Nigeria is definitely one of them. And I don't mean to pick on Nigeria at all, but that was there. Are, there are a couple of places where it's really virtually impossible to work without uh, without paying some kind of a tip uh, or bribe, and it's not a large amount of money. And you know. I have to tell you that it was something I learned in Nigeria that when, you, when I had a moment where I was so upset about this and I started to say this is like pay as you go journalism mm -hmm. this is this is so terrible but I realized that for over 300 years outsiders mostly whites have come to this place first they took their people then they took the palm oil and now they take oil and petroleum and there was always a middleman mm -hmm. there was always a Nigerian who was a middleman and so there's a culture of, you know, they're not, they're not stupid. Nigerians are very, very smart people. And it's like, well, wait a second. I know you're coming here to get something. Well, I need to get a little something if you want that to happen. So I started to look at it in a slightly different way, you know, and um, it doesn't excuse it. I, 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 I try to avoid it whenever possible. But there have been some situations I've been in, thankfully, thankfully, the minority of my career, where you did have to do some kind of transaction. Um, otherwise, there was no way you would get access. There was no way you would get anyone to talk to you. I, well, but I it's think, terrible. Yeah, I hate it. This is very interesting, actually. This, uh, well, the, your, the general advice turned out to be a number of different things. But one is, so actually I'm kind of hearing two things. One is that, sometime, that sometimes you, you need to engage with systems that don't want they could be social systems or societal structures that don't want to cooperate with you. Uh, and then you need to work around as far as possible to stay within your, within you, your personal and your organization's ethical boundaries. Uh, but the other answer is that, that beneath that there, are, there is a very human level where, pe where people need human things. And to try and find out what that thing is that they need to be able to help you, uh, that's kind well, yes, of the answer. Yeah. Well, and also that's why it's so critical, just briefly, sorry to interrupt, yeah. uh, but uh, that it's so critical to find a great fixer, you know, whatever we want to call them, a great local liaison. Mm. That to me is the key because they, they can figure out how to get around all that. And it's also, it reduces for me at least the stress of trying to do all I'm trying to do and then trying to navigate the systems or these cultures that I don't, no matter how much research I've done, I don't always understand. 
And uh, so to me, having a great fixture is yeah. the key. Thank you. you. And thank you so much for your question. That, that opened a very interesting set of answers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're running out of time, I'm realizing. So, so I do need, if, if you have any last minute advice, now for people who are sitting in the audience or watching all over the globe, we have viewers in over 50 countries, uh, who are sitting there thinking, I want to be in a field of research that involves an element of adventure. Do you have any last words to people who may be considering this? How Arian, you look like you do, Bjorn. How, how to get involved, you mean? No, yeah, or some kind of advice, <coughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there are a lot of opportunities, so uh, it's just to look for them and grab them. Yeah, <laughs> grab it, go for it then. Yes. Then let's, let's well, and yeah. No, I'm saying just yeah. to pick up on that is, 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 is follow what you, you know, be sure you sincerely care about what you want to do, yeah. mm -hmm. and then you'll find a way to do it. Mm -hmm. That's very good. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Odin Gustafsson, Laura Alvarez Lopez, Bjorn Persson, and Ed Cashy. Thank you. Thank you. So we have run out of time. The next episode of Crosstalks starts on the hour. We're going to talk about the oceans. See you then. <laughs>